Jason, uh, as you said, this is Down and Dirty, WMNF, and uh, and we appreciate y'all tuning in and listening to us. Uh, we'll jump right into it uh, this morning. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm John Dingfelder. I'm, you are? My, my wife tells me I keep forgetting to say that. You but, should reassure uh, yourself. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've got a, a, a good show today uh, for you. Uh, as I as I often say, we're down and dirty. We like to get down and dirty into local issues. Uh, and uh, and today uh, we have a uh, two two great folks here with us today. Um, I'd like to welcome to our studio candidates for Hillsborough County 13th Judicial Circuit Public Defender. And this race for Public Defender will be decided. Morning in progress. Will be decided in 11 days. Welcome, Rocky Brancato. Good morning, John. Thank you for having us on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, as well. Good morning. And Lisa McLean. Good morning, John. Jason, good to see you. How are you guys doing today? Very good. Yeah, sorry to get you up so early. Yeah, well, you're no candidates. Worries. You're going to be up early We're anyway. Out. Indeed. <laughs> Listen, um, let me give uh, our listeners a little background on the public defender. Uh, it's actually been rather rare that there's a race for public defender because uh, uh, Julianne Holt has held the seat for 30 plus years, and um, and and in my opinion, she's done a, she's done a good job. Um, of course, I have to say that because I used to work for her. But uh, anyway, now that's uh, that's my true feeling. Um, the public defender for Hillsborough County is elected once every four years. As I said, Julianne Holt has held the position for 31 years since 1993. Pretty amazing, right, Jason? Man, it's like I was four. You were four. Uh, Colors and shapes. Like, I was really busy. (laughs) (laughs) The public defender supervises approximately 200 employees, including 120 attorneys, actually one of the largest uh, law firms uh, probably in town and in the state. Uh, Ms. Holt uh, has done that with, I think, about a $25 million budget thereabouts, something like that. That's correct. And the primary job of the public defender and his or her employees is to represent indigent defendants in criminal proceedings, including juvenile, misdemeanor, and felony, and also death penalty cases. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that means you're probably behaving yourself and not a client of the public defender's office. For now. And for the rest of you, uh, okay, we hope everything worked out. Um, so let's get started. We invited the two of you here, um, uh, Rocky and Lisa, if I can be uh, a little less uh, formal. Of course. Um, yep. We invited the two of you here to to chat about yourselves and let the let our listeners know who you are. Um, of course, this is a Hillsborough County uh, race, so those of you who are listening elsewhere around the Bay Area... We hope you find it interesting, but Hillsborough folks can vote for you, for you and, and will be voting for you right now because there's early voting. Right. And uh, and then for the election day, I think is the 20th, uh, Tuesday, the 20th of August, about 11 days away, as I stated. Rocky, um, uh, let's start with you and a little bit of background. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in a military family. We traveled all throughout the United States. Every four years, we'd move. Um, settled up in Pensacola. That's where my family retired. And I... Uh, so was that Air Force or... Air Force. My dad was an Air Force JAG. So that's a military uh, lawyer. Okay. So uh, they retired there. And that's how I ended up starting my career in the Pensacola Public Defender's Office uh, back in 1999. Huh. So let's go back a little earlier. Is it safe to assume... That being military, maybe a conservative family? My family was ab- absolutely very conservative. And that was sort of my seeking my own path after I kind of went out on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Followed I've, in dad's footsteps as a lawyer. Correct, but, correct. But maybe as a public defender might have been a little more progressive or liberal than dad. I, uh, definitely more liberal than him, uh, but I, I have to say, you know, you have to choose a side. You don't, you don't get a choice in that. You learn that in political science 101. Um, you, you can choose to be NPA, but you don't really get a say if you're running. So, you know, I chose Democrat, but I am a very middle-of-the-road, moderate Democrat. Okay. And how did your folks uh, take to you becoming a public defender? 
Well, I mean, uh, I mean, some people are offended. You know, oh, you're a public defender. You represent those people. We've all experienced that as as pub, public defenders and defense attorneys. They, uh, they were supportive. I, I, I think my mom always hoped that I'd go work in one of those big buildings uh, downtown, making a lot of money. And my dad hoped that I would be a prosecutor. Um, but I could never bring myself to leave the office because of the great work and difference we make in the community and individual lives. Okay. Lisa, how about you? Where'd you grow up? I grew up here in the Tampa Bay area. I went to high school at Oldsmore Christian. I went to undergrad at USF and law school at Stetson. Okay. So you, 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 you hung pretty local. And how would you describe your, your family in, in that regard, uh, p- politically conservative, liberal, in between? Um, I grew up in a Pentecostal household, wow. so it is safe to say. I, I was going to guess, perhaps, with the <laughs> Oldsmar Christian. Yes, my parents were very conservative, um, registered Republicans. Of course, when I, you know, when I first registered to vote, I registered as a Republican. But I can tell you that um, I've never voted for a Republican president. It's just as was never my leaning. And you know, once I really got out on my own and found my footing in politics and had a better understanding of where I fit in the world, uh, I joined the Democratic Party. It's kind of interesting. You both sort of had similar paths yeah. away from your family background and doing your own thing as adults. Yeah. That's pretty That's pretty cool. Um, Jason, how about you? I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> you you followed rev- your, your even, parents are liberal, right? Even as a child, I was a revolutionary in khakis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mother's very proud of my progressive and liberal leanings. <laughs> um, so, why the law? Uh, Lisa... Uh, why the law? You you were at USF studying what? I was a humanities major. Okay. Um, and frankly, if there had been more opportunity in that field, I might have, you know, moved forward and gotten a doctorate in some... Philosophy or something. Exactly. My brother had a PhD in philosophy. Exactly. Yeah. And that was really the only PhD I could have gotten at USF that was anywhere close to, to my major. Um, but, did you, you know, ever have Dr. Weatherford, Roy Rutherford? I did not, no. Yeah, he, he was a good friend of ours. He's passed uh, uh, Roy and Doris, but Roy was a doctor. He was a professor in philosophy. Yeah. I never understood anything he was saying, but right. he was a great yeah. guy. Yeah, I'm not sure that I would have been great at, at that particular <laughs> discipline. But, um, you know, I, I really decided to go to law school because I grew up very poor. Um, And my first thought was, you know, I want to get out there and I want to make some money. I don't want to struggle financially the way that my parents did. Um, But then somehow you ended up in a PD's office. Well, you know, that's the thing. Uh, You know, I started it. I I did uh, a clinic, an internship at the state attorney's office when I was in law school. And... That was it. The litigation bug bit me. Um, the public service bug bit me, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so I have, you know, I, I went there originally, much like Rocky said, thinking I'd work in some high rise, you know, rearranging sentences all day long. And um, instead, I discovered that I wanted to be where the action was in the trenches every day. So mm-hmm. that's what I've been doing for 34 years. It's funny, as a, as a matter of disclosure and disclaimer, Rocky and I uh, worked together in the PD's office, I think at least twice maybe three times i was there coming and going he was he was staying there but uh uh, lisa you you and i have not although i used to see you around the courthouse yeah bouncing around from courtroom to courtroom as as we do and you always to your to your uh, credit you always look very determined focused um you know, not horsing around necessarily. You were, you were, you were kind of all business. Is that a fair characterization? You know what? What we do is really important work. Right. The opportunity to defend the Constitution every day is is a big deal, and it's a it's a job I take seriously, um, and it's a privilege to have been able to spend my career making a difference in people's lives every day. So, Rocky, other other than following in Dad's footsteps, uh, why the law? Uh, what was your undergraduate uh, background? So I uh, had a uh, political science uh, major with a minor in philosophy. <laughs> and, you, uh, philosophy. you know, I knew I would go to uh, law school, but wanted to do kind of upper level law enforcement. Um, and like FBI stuff? That, 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 that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, uh, I'm very grateful to my father for steering me away from that mm-hmm. uh, area. I just don't think I would have been happy there. 
Um, really being able to do this type of work, uh, I, I think, has been uh, more gratifying. I, I just don't know another job where you can make such a difference, and, and that really means the world to me. So both of you at a fairly young age uh, decided to be lawyers. I wonder if there's any young kids listening out there who maybe want to be a lawyer. By the way, uh, uh, you can call in. We're going to take some calls in about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, probably about 10, 30, half past at 813-239-9663. Or you can email us at dj at wmnf.org. So, yeah, not the most lucrative area of law, Um <laughs> Lisa, I think you said after the state attorney, you, you went over to the PD. Was that under Judge Lucky or under uh, Julie? No, I, I walked into the office on the first day with Julie Holt. Okay. 1993, January. Yeah, I remember that was a big upset election uh, for her because Judge Lucky uh, had been the incumbent for decades. And, uh, and Julie came in as the upstart. I, I was starting to get involved politically back then. And, and uh, like I said, she'd been there for... Three decades, you walked in with her. Yeah, and I, I had actually tried cases against her when I was a young prosecutor and she was doing uh, private defense work. I had a tremendous respect for her, as we all did. I mean, she was one of those characters in the courthouse that we all, you know, really respected and enjoyed spending time with. And, and uh, how long did you stay in the PD's office? Four years. Okay. I was there for four years, three of which I was a division chief in a felony division. Very cool. And um, so you were supervising um, a handful of other attorneys at that time. Right. As a, as a division chief. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think most of our listeners would necessarily know that. But, um, and Rocky, um, you see, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, I didn't know you. I knew you more as an administrator in the office and a supervisor. Uh, I didn't necessarily know you trying cases, but you must have come in. At fairly at the bottom uh, at, at what year? So I came in in 2003 right when Julie Holt was in her last contested election. Mm -hmm. um, came in as a felony line attorney. I came to the office with a portfolio of about 40 jury trials that I had tried. So that's how I came into felony. Very shortly after that, I got promoted to division chief. Uh, from there, I wanted to be the training director, but Julie had other ideas and she put me in um, sex crimes. Hmm. And so I absolutely... Not a fun place to be. Well, you know, it wasn't where I wanted to be, but uh, she definitely knew what was best for me. I tried some some huge cases during that time, the Kendrick Morris case, the uh, Bloomingdale Library case. Um, I mean, the whole community uh, was watching that high-profile case. Were you case. Lead, lead counsel on those? I was lead counsel, and I think, you know, the community really was worried because we filed a huge motion to suppress that really could have caused the case to go um, in a way maybe that people would not have liked. Uh, but it was part of vigorously representing Mr. Morris and defending the Constitution. But I tried lots lots of cases, uh, spent more time in the trenches than I have uh, as an administrator in the office. But when you did come in, I think I was the training director at that time. Sounds familiar. So uh, she, she eventually let me do what I wanted to do, which was be the training director. And, and that's, I believe, when you came in. Yeah. So, um, which segues nicely, Lisa, to my next question, which is, if you could pick a single case of yours where you were lead counsel, whether or not you won or lost, regardless of which side you were on, um, that had the most personal or professional impact on you, what would it be and why? So, I represented this uh, older gentleman named Henry Becerra. He lived in the jail young apartments over on Florida, which was for low income seniors. He had taken a bad fall in his apartment and wasn't able to get anyone's attention. So the only thing that he had handy was a lighter and he lit a oscillating fan that had been on the floor. He lit that fan on fire to get attention to the fact that he'd fallen. And he was charged with arson mm. for that. Um, we went to trial in that case. He second, was, second degree? Uh, second degree felony. felony ups, punishable by up to 15 yep, years? Absolutely. In state prison. Absolutely. He was incarcerated the entire time his case was pending because he was indigent and couldn't, uh, you know, wasn't able to bond out of jail. And when he was found not guilty, I mean, that was just a, first of all, it was absolutely the right result, but also 
just like, you know, crazy gratifying to have an opportunity to defend somebody like that. Yeah. Um, what was his reaction? He was just relieved. I mean, this was an older guy that had been in the jail for probably four or five months. Um, we actually asked the judge to allow him to be released directly from the courtroom because I've always had um, an issue with the fact that when, when incarcerated folks are found not guilty, they, they remain incarcerated for probably on average about 12 hours. I mean, I guess it depends on when the jury comes back, but, you know, they have to be processed transported and back and processed yeah. and all of that, you know, and, and it's just... Um, I continue to ask that. Every time I get a not guilty, I ask the judge to release my client. So for that gentleman you just told us about, was that uh, as a public defender or as a private criminal attorney? I was a PD. Cool. So that was pretty early in your career. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. How about you, Rocky? Same question. Sure. Important case, memorable case, won or lost, whatever. Sure. Yeah, trying lots of cases. You know, I've even tried cases up until a couple uh, months ago. I tried a wrong way vehicular homicide on the Crosstown. Mm. Also, during the time that you were there, I also I've always had cases, usually homicides. But uh, the I think it really is the Bloomingdale Library case that really was the most profound for me because it was an incredibly high profile case. I really had to devote my entire life to it. I really didn't have much free time. Um, Gentleman was charged with rape of a young girl, underage stu student, as correct. I recall. Um, obviously, we don't want to get into names and that sort of thing. But what was the result? I don't remember. Well, uh, he had a couple different uh, rape charges. She was returning books to the library. And, and now she still, to this day, is you know basically a in vegetative state. Um, hmm. she, he was found guilty. Um, he initially got a sentence of 60 years because the case of Graham v. Florida came out, which basically said you could not give a juvenile um, a life sentence. Um, you had to give them a meaningful opportunity for release based on rehabilitation. What judge was that? Uh, it was Judge Tharp. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judge Tharp. Uh, eventually it got the reversed. Oh, he was, he, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> It got reversed, and he en ended up getting life. The court said, yeah, "Well, you can you can actually give him life." Wow. Um, well, why was that meaningful to you? I mean, you you quote lost, but uh, the the litigation, the, the level of litigation, you know, and anyone can go in and look at the motion to suppress that we we filed. You can go online in the clerk's office and look at it. It was super high level litigation, higher than I've ever done. And the fact that it was a high profile case, I had to deal with the media. Uh, you know, constantly, um, and and frankly, angry people in the community. Sometimes people don't really understand that we're just doing our job. Our job is to defend the Constitution, and that includes sometimes representing people who maybe the public doesn't like. And yeah. it's not. It, it Most really, of the time, it seems like yeah. we cannot be the judge. We cannot be the jury. We have to breathe life to the Constitution by. You know, moving forward, and it was just an incredibly personally challenging case because of all of these different factors. I really grew a lot because of it. Lisa, uh, Rocky brings up a good point. In, in the criminal context, do you feel that that our constitutional rights and liberties uh, are at risk, at jeopardy, especially in the political environment that we've been in in the last five, ten years? I think there's there's no doubt that we are moving in a direction that for those of us that do criminal defense work, you can't help but be concerned. I mean, uh, the search trajectory, and search of, and seizure yeah, the Fourth Amendment is yeah, absolutely coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court, and, and that's not even recently. The, and the, one can only conjecture that they're going to get worse, right? I, I'd have to agree with you. The, yeah. the Florida Supreme Court has gotten very conservative. Mm -hmm. Um. Rocky, you, you bring up a, an interesting aspect that I hadn't even thought about, which is dealing with the press. Or maybe you did, Lisa. And Lee, I, I'll bounce to you, Lisa, on this uh, and come back to you, Rocky. Uh, dealing with the press. You know, typically as a line attorney, as a lower attorney, we were told not to deal with the press. Maybe in, in a in a high-level, you know, death penalty case or, or murder case, you get authority to deal with the press. Uh, what's your experience, uh, Lisa, dealing dealing with the press? Because clearly, if you if you become the public defender, that would be one of your roles. Julie, 
very rarely, I think, would delegate uh, to a PIO or anything like that dealing with the press. Yeah. Now, I have um, had my fair share of high-profile cases over the years. I've never had a lot of contact with the press. I'm not one of those lawyers that wants to try the case in the media. I'd mm-hmm. much rather try the case in the courtroom. Barry, Barry Cohn, rest in peace. Yeah, exactly. And I, th- <laughs> you know, I think that those guys are great. Barry Cohn, Rick Escobar, those guys that, you know, get the community on their side and and make great things happen for their clients. It's not my style. I, I like to to battle it out in the courtroom. Okay. Um, so when the press calls you and you are a public defender. Will, you, will your leaning be not to comment on active cases? Or? Generally, I would say, yeah, that would be that would be the way that I would handle it. Although, you know, every case, John, has to be decided on a case-by-case basis. So it's really about ultimately the client and whatever impact you think any statement you might make is going to have on the client because the client always comes first. Yeah, Rocky, uh, what's your thoughts on the, the press and, and that sort of thing? Well, and I'm glad you asked it because to clarify... When I said dealing with the press, it was more so there is an art when you're litigating a case to dealing with the press because everything that you put right, um, the smallest little thing could lead to uh, an inquiry into an area that the press could pick up on, maybe that people don't know. People don't, uh, one of the things about being a, a defense attorney is we get to investigate the case and we get to bring out what we only intend to use. We have to disclose that to the state attorney. So sometimes we learn things that are, you know, not exactly helpful um, to the case and we don't use it. Uh, but crafting motions and that type of thing, there, there's an art to determine what to put in and what to put out. Um, because you know it's a high-profile case and then somebody's going to be reading it and maybe going further with their own public records that's Correct. Sort of thing, right? they're, they're scrutinizing everything to a level that uh, you, you, you wouldn't uh, believe. And as far as dealing with the press, I, I intend to continue on with the, uh, the way that we uh, ha- have, have done it, which is we generally do not comment publicly on cases. Sometimes the press will contact us about an issue. Uh, that's going on in the system to get information. And, you know, I, I, I don't intend to be an obstructionist there. Mm-hmm. But for people's cases, uh, the default is going to be to not make comments and to try the cases in the uh, courtroom as we have been. Okay. Um, if you're just tuning in, this is WMNF. I'm John Dingfelder. Jason Marlowe is over here. Good morning. Jason, you're mellow today. I, well, I mean, listen, I have no law experience. I just play one on television, so I'm going to let the three people who have actually like experienced this profession sort of speak for it. All this right. is if, a serious if, topic. If you're listening and you're tired of my questions, uh, you can call in now with your own questions, 813-239-9663, or you can email us at dj at wmnf.org. And I think we have the illustrious DJ Spaceship uh, answering our calls. We appreciate that. Um, As we've said a few times, uh, uh, the Honorable Julian Holt has held the position for 30-plus years. Um, Two questions to you guys. A, how long would you like to be public defender? And I know you're going in, you're both going in a little bit older than Julie went in. Uh, I won't divulge ages here, but... uh, uh, and then I'm going to guess both of you are in your 50s. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then uh, what are the pros and cons of anybody holding a position like that for three decades? So I don't know where I left off. Uh, we'll start with you, Rocky. So I uh, have probably three terms in me. Uh, those are four-year terms, so a total of 12. So I have... Uh, Coming in March, I'll have 26 years as a state employee. I started as a certified legal intern back in 1999. So I'd like to serve 12 years, and that'll give me time to put my own footprint, which I already have a footprint there because I work with Julie to to, uh, build the office and figure out what we're going to do. But I want to make it more mine. We don't agree on everything. Um. So I think that's what I got. I'm 52 years old. So that'll put me right around 64 years old. I think that's a good time to retire. I got a almost seven-year-old now. And the second question, what are the pros and cons of anybody holding the position for 30 years? 
Well, the pros are that you can develop the office over the years and uh, move with the times, which is what we've done. Um, all that experience, uh, the relationship with stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, we call them judicial um, uh, partners or justice partners. And who would that be? Uh, so the clerk of court, the chief judge, the sheriff, the uh, Department of Corrections, Department of Juvenile Justice. You have that historical knowledge and then the knowledge of what are the best practices. So, uh, for instance, problem-solving courts, drug courts. Uh, we sit at the table there. Julie Holt sat at the table for a long time. I've been sitting at the table for about 15 years. It, it, about 10 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, the feeling about drug court is, you know, we need to put you in jail if you violate with a dirty urine. Well, the best practice is you need to act swiftly and with the least amount of bearing because we understand built into a drug court that people are going to relapse. So you, you don't necessarily start with jail. You might give them a, a few strikes. Lisa, let's jump to you on the that uh, two-part question uh, uh, how long would you anticipate uh, serving, assuming that you get elected and then reelected and reelected, um, and uh, and any pros and cons of somebody holding a position like that for thirty years? So I'm with uh, I'm with Rocky on the twelve year idea. Both yeah. about the same age. Well, perhaps. I'm a little bit older than he is, um, but you know I hope to live for a very long time and see grandkids and you know my my kids are, are are grown but they're not at that stage yet so and i i can't imagine not working frankly so um but i do have uh, you know some concerns over any administration that has been in office for 30 plus years and i i'm not in any way suggesting that that julie um has not done a fabulous job running that office and obviously that's as we know from being involved in politics and in the criminal justice system it's it's extraordinary um it's certainly extraordinary in in hillsborough county to see that kind of tenure and and more power to her for having done a great job. But, you know, I think that there is the risk that you become sort of entrenched in doing things a particular way. And and sometimes we need a little bit of a shakeup with a fresh perspective and um, someone to come into the office and, um, you know, keep what what's working and fix the things that may not be working and continue to move forward and not you know, be focused on the past, but thinking about the future and how we can do things even better than we're already doing. Them. Well, it, it's good. You're, you're helping me segue into some of the questions that I do have. Uh, I think your campaign literature and some of the speeches I've heard you give speak to change. Um, I would insinuate since you're, you two are the only ones that are running that, uh, that, you know, well, you, I don't even want to say what I insinuate. What do you mean by change, Lisa? Um, are you critical of, of the way Ms. Holt or... Uh, Rocky Brancato have have run the office. Uh, at least Rocky has been there for twenty years, I think. And yes. and um, and what specific changes uh, would you make? You know, some of these presidential candidates or governor candidates, they say on day one I will come in and do blah blah blah. What what specific changes instead of platitudes right. would you make on the first day? Would you fire people? You want me to answer that question first? Uh, there's a lot of questions okay, there. Said there the, answer yeah, any of them you want. There's a lot built in there. So I, I have no intention of walking in there and firing anyone. Okay. Um, everyone that's there has the will have the opportunity to stay. Obviously, I'm going to want to talk to everybody and, and see what I think about whether or not their uh, values are in line with you know how I see the office and, and the mission of the public defender's office. I think that, um, you know, I think that I just have a, I have a very different management style than um, Julie has. And, you know, again, I worked for her for four years and have a tremendous amount of respect for... Describe your style versus hers. Um, I, I am more of a person that I think I'm more trusting. When I, when I see, you know, Julie has has always kind of had the reputation for being a micromanager. And that, that isn't necessarily perceived um, by some folks as being a bad thing. And, and I understand that she takes the position that, that micromanagement is the equivalent of accountability. 
Uh, and I don't see it that way. I, I think that if you do a good job hiring folks and you trust their ability to do the job, that micromanagement isn't necessary. I also think that that, that kind of supervision needs to be happening on a much closer level. For example, as you, as you mentioned, the division chief typically supervises three to five lawyers, depending on the division, and, and perhaps a legal assistant and investigators and that sort of thing. That person, that division chief that's in the courtroom with those lawyers every day and in the office next door to them, answering questions, mentoring, training, doing those things, that is the person that is best suited to help the public defender make decisions about whether or not that person qualifies for a promotion, whether or not that person's not filing the motions that should be filed, not going to the jail to visit clients the way they should. So rather than have, you know, quotas and other things like that that are are burdensome to people, especially folks that want to be public defenders. I mean, you are talking about young, idealistic lawyers, many of whom went to law school specifically to be a PD. And that kind of spirit and that understanding of the mission needs to be supported by administration. Being a PD is a very, very difficult job. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes in terms of the loss of PDs <laughs> and attrition and 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 re rebuilding the ranks, um, Rocky. Um, I, I'm pretty confident you're not going to be critical of the current uh, public defender and and what she's done. But but what what specific changes are you proposing, if any, uh, when you when you uh, quote get elected? Well, uh, I, I mean, I think it's important to address some of the things that were just said, uh, sure, rather than than just not. Uh, no, please. So, I mean, one of the things that's we're been used to rebuttal in court, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, one of the things that's been incredibly apparent to me on the campaign trail is that Lisa really does not know what goes on in the office. She does speak with a broad brush. So what she just described as far as the division chiefs managing the attorneys and checking to see what they're doing, that's exactly how it works. Um, they report to me, I report to Julie, and it, there is not micromanagement. The things we look at, these are not Julie Holt things or Rocky Brancato things. They are rules of professional conduct. So we definitely um, trust but verify because we do have sometimes attorneys who should not be doing this work. And if they're not going to the jail, guess who we represent, John? You already know, it's substantially black and brown people, disadvantaged people. I wanna make sure they have the best representation. Our representation is better than you can get for a lot, from a lot of private attorneys. And I want to ensure that it stays at level. So we're going to continue looking to see what people do. We have a family. Now, as far as people leaving the office and that type of thing, we have 20 attorneys on staff right now who left and returned back to the office. Um, and uh, my understanding is that Lisa actually applied to come to our office before she ran um, a few years ago. So for such bad people and micromanagers, my, under my question is, why would you apply? I, you know, I think she came in with a command that she wanted to be in, you know, homicide. Um, but, um, you know, we didn't hire her, obviously. But so what things will I change? Um, I will. Um, the juvenile way we do juveniles. Um, I'm going to create a juvenile specialist position. As you know, the juvenile gun violence problem is not now limited to East Tampa anymore. It's spreading all throughout the um community. And even if it was just limited to East Tampa, it's a substantial problem and it, we have to address it. So I will have a very experienced attorney who represents juveniles charged as adults on those gun cases. So we can work on ways to reduce recidivism because the bottom line is if they're going to prison, they're eventually getting out and that is not increasing public safety. I think I read in your literature that, uh, and Lisa, we will get back to you because things were said. But uh, Rocky, um, in your literature, you said something about juveniles and that you're, you're not going to use that as a training ground for new public defenders or system public defenders anymore. You want to extrapolate on that a little bit? or Sure. And, and this is nothing... Just ground briefly. Yeah, it's nothing groundbreaking, but our juvenile brew, I'm not talking about as adults, but juveniles just come through uh, as delinquents. 
Um, we use that as a training ground. We have experienced division chiefs who train attorneys there. Because there are actually trials sometimes. Correct, there are. We do, we do try a lot of cases there. But I want to transform that to a bureau where people who want to represent juveniles as a career, that they can do so. Because I believe that they are the best positioned uh, know how to deal with juveniles the best, uh, relate to juveniles the best, and it will help us with retention because over the years I've noticed we've lost a lot of attorneys who just wanted to represent juveniles and we made them go other places. Now, like I said, Julia and I uh, agree on many things. This is an area we've disagreed over the years, and she told me when you become public defender, you can change it, and I'm going to change it. Lisa, um, uh, Rocky uh, said some things. You want to respond? It's up to you. Yeah, Rocky has said a lot of things on the campaign trail that are disingenuous and well, disrespectful. Here's your, here's your chance to clean the, clear the record. I have oh. worked very diligently during the course of this campaign to not roll around in the mud and respond to uh, the kind of attacks that, that have come my way from Mr. Brancato. I have to assume that he's worried about whether or not he's going to win this election or he wouldn't be saying some of the things that he has said on the campaign trail. Okay. Um, some people were surprised, including myself, that you got the endorsement of the Times. Um, just, you know, I didn't know you that well, but I was just surprised in regard to the fact that, you know, Rocky sort of been the heir apparent, uh, but you got the endorsement. Uh, uh, tell us about that. Were you, well, you know, tell this, us how you felt, and were you surprised? In this country, democracy is about elections, not coronations. Mm -hmm. And having an opportunity to interview with the editorial board at the Times gave me uh, a chance to speak with knowledgeable folks that have been watching the public defender's office over the year and agree with my essential platforms, including the fact that the office needs some change and that I am the person to best bring that necessary change. I'm a board certified criminal trial lawyer. That allows me to call myself an expert. Less than 1% of all the lawyers in the state of Florida are board certified in any particular field. So, you know, I think that the editorial board at the Times took the time to study the things that I'm talking about considered the history of the public defender's office and decided that change was necessary. We, um, Rocky, how, how did you feel about the, the Times editorial? Did you write a rebuttal? Sometimes people write rebuttals when they don't like the editorial. You know, the, the, the end result is that a uh, endorsement from any newspaper is just an opinion. I think Lisa should be proud of her endorsement. And I'm not uh, doing anything to try to undermine it. I would only point out that it's an outlier because uh, she has that endorsement and she has the endorsement of Ruth's List. I have the endorsement of the Tampa Firefighters, the Hillsborough Firefighters, the Tampa PBA, the West Central Florida Labor Union, the Florida Sentinel Bulletin, the La Gazzetta, the LGBTQ Caucus, the Florida LGBT Caucus, M Muslims for Democracy, the B Florida Black Caucus. Um, Democratic Black Caucus. So it really is an outlier, but I think she should be proud of it. And I'm not taking anything away from that. And also... The well, do you think endorsements are, are important or not important? I, th I, I think they're important. And I really don't want to uh, try to denigrate her endorsement there. Like I said, I would like her to be proud of the endorsement that she got from the Times. I'm not going to say anything else about that. I think endorsements are important. That's why, and, I, and I've gotten a lot of them. The other thing is the negative campaigning that's going on has happened from Lisa and a group of her people. It's on video, on the internet, and I have stayed above board. But I'm not going to sit and be attacked and uh, do nothing about it. So right. she can spin it however she wants. Well, fortunately, it'll all be over in 11 days. That's the only. That's the good news for the two of you, right? That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. We agree on that. So you're both running as, as Democrats. So this is a partisan, strangely enough, it's a partisan position. It shouldn't um, be. It, I mean, it, it, I mean, not to chime in. No, but I, I want just, you to chime in. I mean, it, I just, I don't feel like party, partisan politics, particularly the idea of national partisan politics, should be injected into a race where 
politics should not be relevant. I mean, ultimately, you're trying to help indigent folks, you know, under the, you know, the guise of the Constitution. I don't think that's necessarily something where we should be well, let's identifying ask, let's folks Let's ask by these DR. guys what they think. Lisa, partisan, should this be a partisan position? I don't think so. Yeah. No, it should not. Yeah. yeah. Um, See, we're all in agreement here. A lot of a lot of people, I think, a lot of voters don't even know that that uh, these constitutional officers in Hillsborough County, anyway, are partisan elections until they get to to vote on it. This this time around, for you two, it doesn't matter. You're both Democrats. It's going to be decided in eleven days, and it's going to be over because there's no Republican running. Um, but I guess it leads to the question: Is is politics? important for this job and why and for those of you just tuning in we're talking about the public defender's office in hillsborough county which obviously has become a rather heated uh race between these two candidates rocky Brancato and lisa mclean and they're and i can assure you they're both good qualified good people and they're both do i'm, I'm confident they'll both do a good job but the voters in hillsborough county will have to decide in 11 days which one they like better but Going back to the question, is politics in any form needed or necessary to do the job of public defender? I, th I think it depends on your definition of politics. Um, I don't think that politics should play a role in the important work of the PD. But I think a lot of people think about politics in terms of your ability to get along with others, your ability to build relationships. And so from that perspective... Um, you know, we've got to we've got to get along with law enforcement. We've got to get along with the state attorney's office. However, we also need to be in a position to stand up to the state, stand up to law enforcement, because we all know if you read a newspaper or watch TV that the role of defense attorneys in this country is so important to hold those entities feet to the fire and make sure that they are honoring the principles that are important to us in the Constitution. Ms. Holt, um, especially I would say probably in the last decade or so, uh, focused a lot on going to Tallahassee and working on the bigger picture. Of, I, know, I don't even know what, you know, all the things she did up there, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure she increased salaries and benefits for, for public defenders and the staff, um, as, as well as, you know, perhaps working on other criminal justice issues in Tallahassee. That's just a big guess on my part, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, how, do you see yourself, do you see that as part of the role uh, of the public defender, question one? And question two is, when Julie did it, Julie, as we know, has a big voice. She's got a big personality, okay? You got you two, and Rocky, I've known you for a while. Lisa, I've watched you for a long time. You seem a little, you know, you're not Julie Holt. You know, those are big shoes to fill in terms of her mouthpiece. How do you how do you do that? Is that important to continue to go to Tallahassee and, and carry on that uh, as the second or third largest county in the state? It's, it's absolutely important. And, uh, you know, this last uh, term I went uh, with, with Julie to Tallahassee. And I've been to Tallahassee as well, advocating for the Pace Center for Girls, uh, being a board member there. Um, but yeah, whoever says as public defender that you're not a politician, that's absolutely wrong. Because we're managing forces, we're managing resources, and the ability to retain good attorneys and to attract good attorneys is, is a, in a large part depending on funding. And we're all competing for funding, all the different organizations. Lately, we've been going in there unified and not fighting. We go unified with the state attorney's office. So at least the legislature doesn't have to deal, deal with bickering and they can see how much to, to give both offices. Uh, but it's crucial. And it's also crucial to get money for programs here locally, like with the county commission for our problem solving courts. Uh, you know, we get funding uh, for the, from them and also for our technology. Um, so absolutely but yeah. Rocky, uh, going to the second part of my question, uh, Julie, you know, she had a strong and forceful personality that she used pretty effectively locally and in Tallahassee. I see you as a kind of a soft-spoken, you know, perhaps, you know, deep thinker, but a soft-spoken, uh, you know, person. So how are you going to be able to fill those very large shoes or, as my wife says, those very large pumps? 
<laughs> okay, that was... Is that bad? No, that was good. Oh, that, that was good. That, okay. that, that was the winner. Right. So I'll, I'll say it we this way. We used to way. say that about Phyllis Bizanski because she had very large shoes. <laughs> so I'll say it this way. I preserve energy. I don't waste energy until it's time to do so. Okay. So I will have no difficulty going to Tallahassee. Uh, her shoes are incredibly big to fill, but I have no doubt that I will be able to do it. And very importantly, I have that mentorship behind me that I take with me in that actual experience uh, that's going to be instrumental in continuing to do the type of advocacy in Tallahassee that we've done mm -hmm. over the years. Uh, Lisa, uh, you, you seem a little soft-spoken. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe that's just you on the campaign trail. I don't know. I haven't seen you in court. I mean, you know, arguing in front of a jury, you're probably much different. But anyway, same question. Completely agree that relationships both here and in Tallahassee are incredibly important. Julie has done a fabulous job at bringing money back to Hillsborough County. But, you know, I have worked with folks in Tallahassee when I was when I worked for the attorney general, when I was the bureau chief of statewide prosecution here in Tampa. Um, so have had a lot of I have a history with folks in Tallahassee and relationships that I think will be very beneficial to continue uh, the trajectory of Julie's work. So. Lisa, in your, in your campaign mailer, which I thought I brought with me, but I don't seem to see it, but uh, I'll try and quote it. You say, you will do your best or you will attempt to reduce crime by expanding youth outreach programs to help address the root causes of crime. Um, can you expand on that a little sure. bit? And I mean, you know, everybody says things in generalities on campaign literature, but let's be a little more specific here. Right. And by the way, if you want to join the conversation, we've got about... Eight minutes left, and it's 813-239-9663. We will take your question and pass it on to these two fine public defender candidates in Hillsborough County. Lisa. So when, when you talk about the idea of reducing crime, I think a lot of people think, well, that seems like that would be a platform or something that the state attorney candidates ought to be talking or about. Or the state legislature. Right, but the reality is is that we all want to be safe. We all want to live in communities where we can move about freely and not be concerned about crime. And the role, in my opinion, of the public defender in that regard is to be involved with other agencies like Safe and Sound, like the Boys and Girls Club, um, like the spring, you know, all of the agencies that we're all familiar with um, be in the public school system to to address those root causes of crime like childhood poverty, homelessness, trauma, mental health issues, drug addiction, that without a, without addressing those root causes that these are the reasons why people make bad decisions. These are the reasons why somebody who is otherwise law-abiding has a really bad day and, and does something that they shouldn't have done. And now we as the public defender's office are tasked with giving them the best possible representation. But if we're not, if we're not out in the community listening to the things that are important to the communities that we represent, then we're not going to be able to get the job done and the community is not going to be a safer place for us to live. Um, and I, I see that as, as, a, as a vital part of the public defender's office mission. But isn't there some concern that the, the, the legislators or the governor or the state attorney would say, hey, you know, you've got your job to do. Why don't you stay in your own lane? What's your response? I, I just don't, I don't agree with that. I see, I see the public defender's office mission as not only providing uh, quality representation to those um, that we represent, but also, again, to be listeners, to be in the community, to understand the things that are important to the communities that we're representing. Because if we don't maintain, if we don't have those open lines of communication, then we have unhappy clients and we're not doing our jobs. Rocky, uh, looks like we have a call. We do. I'm, I'm gonna jump in and see, uh, see who we can grab there. Who is it? Caller, you are on the air. Who is this and where are you calling from? This is Leela calling from Brandon. Hey, Leela, we've heard from you before, and we appreciate yes. you listening and calling. What's going on? Yeah. My question is, is, uh, is what is the plan as far as housing and things for the re-offenders that are coming back into our communities? 
and is there a plan? And would either candidate be willing to form a coalition with the sheriff's office and with the court system uh, to do um, a situation that would actually make it safer when the encampments start for our homeless? Because with the encampments and without housing for the felons coming out of prison, we're going to have a big problem with housing for them. Okay. All right. We appreciate the call. Appreciate the question. And we appreciate what you do out in in Brandon with the homeless. Uh Uh, Rocky, we'll jump to you on that. Thank you for calling. Uh, So we currently have members uh, serving on the reentry board. Uh, which is made up of local stakeholders, the sheriff's office and state attorney's office and others, and also ex-offenders. And that is not something that the public defender will solve on its own. That's a village issue where we all have to continue to put our heads together, um, work with the county. Um, You know, there's... Current. At the end of the day, it's like a recidivism issue, right? That it, we want to all it, it work is. together to, it is. <clears throat> and to we reduce def- recidivism. We are a part of that, and we're going to continue to be a part of it. And we would absolutely be a part of any coalition with the sheriff's office on, on the the encampments. Right now, we've d- developed uh, you know some litigation on the encampments uh, because they're charging people with tr- trash, um, having felony littering when it's not federal litter, felony littering. It's really just their personal items in these encampments. So we're working in the courts on that, but we want, we would love to be a part of a coalition. Yeah, and wasn't, was it the U.S. Supreme Court, Lisa, or the Florida Supreme Court that said that uh, homeless could be arrested for being on public property and that sort of thing? Well, I can't remember that one. I think it's it's certainly a local issue. There's no question about that. And, and you know, the public defender's office role in these kinds of issues, and I know that, that this is something that Rocky and I agree on, is to be on the cutting edge of the litigation that, that deals with these kinds of issues that are going to be affecting the clients. You know, panhandling, enforce, enforcement of panhandling, those are all tricky issues of a balance of First Amendment rights and, and, and pers- you know, personal freedoms and that sort of thing. Okay, um, we, we tapped on this a little while ago. Uh, public defender's office and state attorneys all across the state are unusually shorthanded right now. I don't know if it's true in Hillsborough or not. Um, resulting, if you're shorthanded in the office, your attorneys have too many cases and they do less of a, a, a don't do as good a job. Uh, Jason's telling me we've only got about a minute left to go, but very quickly... How do you address that? What are, what are the causes of it? How do you address it, Lisa? How do you address the... Being shorthanded. What, what's causing it, um, in, you know, in terms of retention, attorney retention and that sort of thing? Well, you know, look, the, there, there are a lot of, of lawyers at the public defender's office that are not happy. And I know that because they talk to me. They seek me out to tell me about concerns they have within the office. So, you know, it's one of the reasons why I think that the style of management needs change because happy lawyers make for happy, well-represented clients. All right, Rocky, real quick. We we are absolutely on the right trajectory. We currently have over 100 attorneys. We're funded for 120. Um, We're going to be the best bosses that we can be, um, and we are getting the word out about public defending. Things are changing. All agencies have had issues. It's not unique to us. It's unfair for Lisa to to make these broad statements okay. that are untrue. All right. Uh, Lisa McLean, Rocky Brancato, I think we've kept it pretty tame. You guys are professionals. You're up for election in Hillsborough County Circuit 13. Uh, the election is 11 days. I hope everybody goes out and not only votes, but vote down ballot. Vote down ballot because vote voting every race. for the public defender is a very important vote. We appreciate you guys coming in this morning. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, John and Jason. Thank you, Alfred. Rocky. Thank you. And make sure people know this is a universal primary. All voters of all parties, including NPAs, get to vote in this, Thank in this you. race. And also vote now if you want to. You can vote early um, and that sort of thing. <coughs> Jason, you take us out on a beautiful song. Yeah, I'm not sure what.